I want to talk a little bit about uh, this notion of the evolution of health systems. Um, but I'm going to begin with a metaphor, actually. Uh, and that is, when you checked into the hotel today, you might have asked the uh, receptionist, uh, I need to use the men's room or the ladies' room. Could you point me? And if they had pointed you out behind the hotel uh, to something that looked like an outhouse, you might wonder if they weren't familiar with the paradigm of indoor plumbing, or maybe they didn't deserve the four-star rating that this hotel has, right? If you'd gone back and said, hey, I need to send off a few messages while I'm here, I need to communicate um, with my coworkers, and they handed you a carrier pigeon, you might also wonder just exactly where you were and whether or not they were familiar with modern technology. <clears throat> my point is this. Uh, you might respond this way, mostly because we have the benefit of a lot of technology. There are a lot of modern accoutrements that shift the way that um, we solve the problems we now face. And, uh, beyond a bad Chucky Chan meme, right? Uh, really, the question is, uh, the hospitals, and I think you know where I'm going, the hospitals that still anchor our health systems are not so different uh, from the hospitals from 100 years ago, right? The concept is the same. Yeah, they're cleaner, they're more modern, there's more technology in them, but they're still anchored in a really fundamental foundation about where our health problems were as a society when hospitals first arose, uh, and their inability to shift um, in the modern day. So um, this is a bit of an unusual position for me, to stand on stage and not to be talking about technology or the new breakthroughs in science. Um, I actually spent uh, uh, nearly two decades uh, at a design firm, a global uh, design and innovation firm called IDEO. I ran the healthcare business there up until about five years ago. Uh, and that was my life. I took remarkably groundbreaking science and technology uh, from the universities that surrounded me in, the, in, in Silicon Valley and applied them <coughs> uh, to the health problems that we saw in front of us. And I realized after working there for the better part of you know, 12 years, I was really only working on the edges of the dysfunction. Um, uh, and I decided that uh, I wouldn't work anymore on those tools and those mechanisms unless I could get at the core of the systemic problem that we face. So uh, I'm doing, I moved. Um, I'm also, I moved to a, a new job, and I'll tell you about that. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a student of history. I, um, I am both a student of history and an optimist. Those things don't have to be at odds. Um, and um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of a history lesson around um, healthcare and healthcare systems, um, if you'll let me. So if you go way back, and I mean way back, like BC, 0 AD, um, it's actually interesting to understand how our modern health systems have arisen. Right? So if you look at um, the things that killed us you know, 2,000 years ago, there were things like epidemics, really mass infectious diseases that you know, spread through the population. Uh, uh, the Justinian plague, was the bubonic plague, was actually the first, thing, uh, first recorded pandemic. The Black Death killed something like you know, a third of the Eurasian population. Uh, cholera, smallpox, the great sanitary awakening where governments started to realize that sanitation um, was a key to actually keeping disease at bay. Um, and then in the 1900s, we started putting, you know, environmental and, and, and sanitation concerns um, into our infrastructure. Um, those are the things that killed us there. And then the second, th that gave rise to essentially to our public health system. Um, and then if you look at uh, the red line called health of economic drivers, I kind of hate to call it that, um, but it is called that because um, hospitals, which were the response to that need, were actually originally derived and built um, to ensure uh, the viability and health of slaves and of soldiers, which were economic drivers of that time. You wanted to ensure that your investment in slaves, which was your workforce, um, uh, that they stayed well so they could continue to serve you, and that the, the soldiers you put on the war, uh, on the field, on, on the battlefield, um, remained viable. And so you developed these field hospitals to solve for their traumatic injuries and hopefully put them back into service. Um, much later in the 1900s, we started putting together voluntary general hospitals for the physically ill and then public institutions um, for the mentally ill. Um, it's important to remember what we used to call those. Um, we used to call those infirmaries. That's where we hid the ill, the physically ill, and we called them asylums, where we hid the mentally ill. Uh, much later in the 1800s, the first smallpox vaccination with Edward Jenner, um, and then uh, Louis Pasteur develops the first attenuated uh, vaccine for rabies, and that begins our public vaccination efforts. Um, it wasn't really until the beginning of the 20th century they started paying attention to health 
of actual human individuals. These were mostly systemic interventions, right? Sanitation systems, hospitals, meant um, uh, vaccinations. They never treated any individual as an individual entity, something that needed to be um, addressed uh, and, and uh, facilitated as a human being. So our responses then look like this, right? Public health systems, um, I'll call it acute sick care. They, they manifested in hospitals originally, now clinics, um, vaccines, and, and primary care. That was our societal response to the things that made us ill, you know, uh, uh, 2,000 years ago and even um, 200 years ago. If you go back um, to the beginning, uh, just after the Great War, World War I, um, you can actually find a report uh, commissioned by uh, the British government asking the Minister of Health at that time um, to suggest a systemic response to the need of health, uh, a systemic healthcare response to the needs of individuals um, in Great Britain at the time. I'm not gonna read this to you. Um, but what uh, Lord Dawson of Penn did uh, was to prescribe a model for healthcare um, that still persists to this day. Um, these are uh, illustrations drawn directly from that report. Uh, he describes in a region the need for uh, primary care hospitals, then secondary ones that are more specialized, um, some services that he called domiciliary, which means they go to the home, uh, and a large teaching hospital with a medical school that anchors all that region. Sound familiar? Um, they even laid out what wards should look like. And the thing is, our healthcare system now really hasn't changed all that much. You'll see direct lineage from these to the ones that we now uh, have today. So <clears throat> that response um, really became the foundation of our current health system, right? Public health, vaccinations as a component to that, acute sick care in hospitals, clinics, primary care evolved as the first touch point when you got ill. And that's where we began. Um, they really were two systems, one of prevention before anyone manifested with illness and then systems of reaction after someone was acutely ill enough that they needed intervention. That was the basis uh, of our healthcare system and, and appropriately given those are the things that um, most likely made us ill or killed us. Um, but actually, uh, because we've made pretty substantial progress on these, uh, the rise of antibiotics, of vaccinations, our ability to treat traumatic injury, um, those things don't actually make us ill. They don't really uh, kill us nearly as much as they did 100, 200 years ago. Um, and as a partial consequence of that success, of the advancement in science and in practice, uh, the modern nature of disease and mortality has changed quite a bit. Today, the things that make us ill are really chronic diseases, right? They're rooted in social and behavioral and genetic factors, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, depression, suicide, mental illness. Those are the things that make us ill. And those things don't get solved in the healthcare systems we have now. You don't walk into a clinic, get an injection, and, and magically not have diabetes anymore. It doesn't work that way. Now, you can't get a three-day stay and not be obese anymore. There are all sorts of issues that have arisen that are part of the modern nature of disease um, that really aren't fundamentally addressed well by the healthcare system that we have. So um, some statistics. So chronic disease, or the global health folks call it non-communicable diseases, uh, will kill 41 million people next year, 71% uh, of all deaths globally. That graphic on the left, the blocks are you know, large disease states. Um, <clears throat> the large majority of them are non-communicable. They're chronic diseases. Some of them are infectious. Some of them are trauma and injury. If you look at low socio-demographic uh, index countries, uh, the balance is still uh, shifted towards um, infectious disease and injury because they have poor infrastructure generally. But the things that really kill us now are very, very different than the ones that killed us 200 years ago. The nature of disease has changed. Uh, the modern healthcare system has not. So what then? Or so what then, right? What, what should we do about that? Um, you know, the sad part is in healthcare, we really never get the opportunity to design a new model that really embraces wholesale change. We never get the proverbial blank slate. Um, I would modify that by saying that we rarely get that opportunity. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about an opportunity that I've um, been gifted uh, and some of the work that I've been doing uh, globally to find other places that have a little bit more opportunity than usual to make big change. And when you're faced with something like that, um, you take a different approach. And I'm going to share a little bit about that as well. 
So um, I'm a very accidental academic. Um, I got recruited to the University of Texas at Austin, and there's a, lot, uh, there's a bunch of really unique circumstances in Austin, um, and it's worth dwelling for a moment to explain to you what those are. So in 2012, so Texas is number one on uh, the, the uh, list of states in the U.S. Um, for uninsured, 18%. Uh, Texas didn't expand Medicaid. The state left it up to the urban areas and the local governments to fund health care for the poor um, if that's what they wanted to do. And most of the large urban areas do. They develop a health care district. They usually tax um, as a function of property tax. Um, there's no state income tax. And so in 2012, the... Um, the residents of Travis County, which is mostly Austin, voted to raise the component of their property tax that's dedicated to health care for the poor. They voted to raise it by 63%, which is insane. It generates about $100 million annually once you do federal matching funds and all that stuff to essentially care for the poor. Um, that paid for a new hospital. It replaced a 40-year-old hospital um, that was essentially decrepit and needed to be replaced. Importantly, that hospital that was built anew is exactly the same size as the hospital replaced in a city that is the fastest growing city in the U.S. eight years in a row. We're making a very explicit bet that the new model of health and healthcare does not reside in traditional clinical environments. Um, it funded uh, a new medical school, the first one at a tier one academic research university in 50 years, um, to the tune of $35 million a year. Um, no other medical school in the country um, has that much community support spoken for in dollars. Um, but most importantly, it pays for a very unique payer. Central Health, which is the local health care district, uh, made a commitment <coughs> to eschew, to disavow the traditional fee-for-service system because they said it doesn't produce the health outcomes um, that society asks for. And so they committed themselves to a value-based model of care where providers of health care, professionals, and systems um, get rewarded when they produce better outcomes. That's very unique. Um, we have a lot of levers. Uh, obviously, a very engaged community, um, a positive feedback loop because we manage both the funding and the delivery of care through the local uh, providers. Uh, we teach differently. We have a local focus. We're big enough to actually make a difference. Um, new financial incentives, lots of entrepreneurial platforms for trying new things. But all of that really means is, what that means is that we're taking a very system approach. Um, to solving for this. And we're actually designing a system to try to create a better health outcome for the community that we serve. Um, it gave rise to the Design Institute for Health, which is uh, what I founded in LEED, which is a joint collaboration between the medical school and the School of Design, part of the College of Fine Arts. And, and we practice a lot of things that um, lay people expect designers to do, right? We do product design, environments, design of communications. But I'll tell you, most of our work is done on the bottom row, service design, organization design, and actually design of systems, which is kind of a new field, a combination between systems thinking and human-centered design. Um, and when we came to town, we said, actually, if you take a historical perspective, um, the foundation of our, modern, or of our traditional healthcare system really have become the bookends of what we need, right? Public health and acute sick care are actually really addressing two ends of the spectrum. And in the middle, there's this thing about monitoring and maintenance and management of people with chronic diseases that we really haven't figured out how to do, certainly not systemically, uh, and that we'd spend some time doing that. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of a framework um, in order to use it and express to you some of the work that we're doing. Uh, if you take that spectrum, right, you put um, our traditional bookend of, you know, public health and prevention on the left side and you put acute care on the right side, there's a whole spectrum. And you might label this differently, uh, you might uh, uh, give it different words, but it's roughly this idea that, you know, from the left, um, there's this idea then you move in, there's some routine care and diagnosis to identify when people start getting ill. Uh, people who are starting to broach chronic disease that you can actually do active interventions and potentially reverse uh, that trend, people who have chronic disease that you actually actively manage it to keep them from exacerbating and end up in an acute care scenario, right? That's a spectrum from well to sick. Um, you heard uh, uh, Rocco and Rebecca talk a little bit about uh, the determinants of care, including social determinants. I won't bore you with that. I expect this audience understands that. But again, uh, the things that actually make us healthy um, are surprisingly limited uh, in, in the medical arena. For every one of us as an individual, our access to and the quality of our medical care only contributes 11% to our individual health outcome, right? Why do we spend so much money and so much energy on something that has 
actually fundamentally so little effect. Individual be behavior is huge. Social circumstances, the zip code you grew up in, your gender, your race, your access to food and transportation, huge. Genetics and biology, of course, and then your physical environment as well, quality of air, things like that. So if you take that, those are, you know, I, I, uh, I shared with you the nature of the need. If these are the factors that actually shape your health, then you could lay that down on the, on the, on the left side and create a grid, right? Sized proportionally to their impact on any individual's health. You now have a landscape. And you might ask, where would we dwell? Where would we put our energy and our focus if we were actually going to change the health of a community? If these are all the things. Here's the way we intervene and the factors that matter. How would we spend our time? We don't actually take the time to actually take a step back and think about it that way anymore, right? This is a clean slate problem. Let's take a clean slate approach. Um, the traditional health system sits in these blocks, right? Woefully inadequate to address the broad landscape of issues that actually address health in community and society. Okay. Let's take a health economic standpoint. Let's play just economist. If we did that, um, we might choose to invest our money and effort on the bottom left, right? Keep the people who are healthy, healthy. It's cheap, they're well already. But that doesn't feel right. Like, we wouldn't let people who are sick die. We believe in the, in the, in the value of every human life. But I, I, no one takes a strict health economics view only in developing a health system. But here's one filter, right? Here's the second filter. Where's the prevalence of illness? That might help you figure out where you would focus your time and energy. You know, uh, broadly, globally, that's about right. Most of the stuff is actually in chronic disease. Depends a little bit on the development of infrastructure in, in countries. But as an approximation, that's pretty close. What if we um, thought about uh, um, our existing capabilities, right? That's born of our legacy systems, right? A lot of stuff. Uh, on the right, uh, because we're good at it, uh, public sanitation, public safety, things that we've done for a long time, but actually not a lot in the little. We're starting to bleed out into it. You see how primary care has evolved pretty dramatically over the course of the last 40 years. It's starting to move into chronic disease management, but it's still anchored in the traditional health system. What if you talked about societal values? How would you, how would you heat map it then? What do we care about? Do we, we care for the ill. We should take care of those people who are ill and not well, right? We should intervene on them. So if you overlaid all these in any combination, right, you get a heat map of sorts. It would give you a first suggestion, not perfectly precise, not perfectly quantitative, but it would give you a first chance to start thinking about how should we build a system if we were given that opportunity? Where would we focus? Where would we put our energy and our time and our effort and our money? And even if you built a system that was perfectly attuned to the needs of a society and community, you still have to convince them to use it. Right? Because we all retain the right to self-determination. So any one of us might actually walk into that system and decide, you know what, I'm not interested in that service you've provided me because I have my own predilections. So we have to think about it that way too. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about how we filled this map out in Austin, Texas. Um, we think there's, we spend, a, there are a lot of people who are very ill. Um, uh, the 200 high utilizers, that's terminology for people who access the public health system the most, um, they cost the taxpayers in Travis County every year $40 million, just those 200 people, in ambulance visits, care, uncompensated uh, um, uh, interventions. You could house, feed, entertain, reintegrate with society, educate for far less than the amount of money if you actually gave them care beforehand. By giving them insurance, we are. Right? And we can utilize that money. So it's actually a real economic incentive to think about this differently. But that's the health economics that's driving our system. Um, I'm going to layer on prevalence of illness. Just like the rest of the country, lots of chronic disease. Um, we can identify a lot of people who are pre-chronic. We can't actually intervene on them just yet, but that's where the prevalence is. Um, where are our existing capabilities? You know, again, where you would expect them. We do have some pretty uh, forward-leaning uh, uh, community-based organizations that are working on the social circumstances and individual behavior, as you would find in a lot of urban areas. Um, and then you layer on societal values. By virtue of the tax that we voted into fruition, um, we made a pretty clear statement that we care about all of it, but specifically for those uh, who are usually unserved, um, and usually occupy lower socioeconomic strata. So, so given that map, how would you intervene? What would you launch? 
to actually solve for the needs of a system like that. I'll share with you a couple of the interventions that we did. Um, one was called integrated practice units. So we committed ourselves to a value-based model of care. We only, we only want the health system to get paid when it actually makes an outcome. You never pay your mechanic for working on your car but not actually fixing it, right? Well, that's kind of how the US healthcare system works. Um, so we said, look, um, we believe integrated practice units, which is groups of uh, nurses and doctors and other allied health professionals working together, if they're measured and reimbursed on the entire whole person outcomes of an individual, and they engage the individuals in their care, um, they can produce better value for the system. So we launched that. Um, here's a cartoon that describes roughly our view of what was the before and after. Before should seem familiar to you, right? Any of you who've interacted with the traditional healthcare system spend a lot of time going between a lot of people and waiting a lot in between. Um, we believe that um, actually if you bring an individual in, um, you give them some agency, and you give them every resource they could possibly need to affect all of their health needs, medical providers, mental health, social workers, financial counselors, nutrition, exercise, that we might actually have stand a better chance of identifying the things that actually affect them, and we actually might make a bigger difference. When you come to our clinics, you don't get 10 minutes, you get anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. We might actually get through history and physical, diagnosis, imaging, read of the image, and actually even a procedure if that's what you need. Um, uh, we eliminated the waiting rooms. There are no waiting rooms in our clinics. Um, when I told the dean, I said, if you want us to work on this, I'm going to ask you one thing, which is just declare from the mount there will be no waiting rooms. He's like, I've never seen a clinic without a waiting room. I was like, that's great. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it can't exist. I'm pretty sure Toyota Motor Company doesn't warehouse its parts. It does just-in-time manufacturing. We don't have to warehouse our patients. Cool? He's like, all right, it's up to you then. So we did. So we got rid of the waiting rooms. Um, this is the entry to our medical clinic. It looks more like an airport concourse. Uh, it's disorienting is the way most people describe it because they expect something very, very different. Uh, we took on a very different approach. This is a layout of one of the clinic modules. They're all the same for every single specialty we do. We took on this notion of a front of house and back of house. In a restaurant, you don't see a chef cutting the head off a fish from the dining room, right? When you go to a theater, you don't see someone running the pulleys for the sets. There's a reason for that. And so by separating the efficiency needs in the, uh, of the back of the house, with the clinical needs, from the front of the house, we could do things like carpet the front hallway, which made it quieter, which lowered anxiety, which allowed people then to engage in their own model of care when they had to be part of the model. We asked patients to actually identify their own goals. We measure ourselves by the accomplishment of those goals, and we ask them to participate by reporting their outcomes. It's a fundamentally different model. Um, we designed the clinic so they look differently. Um, uh, uh, they, we, we, you know, really simple things like providing seating so that uh, 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 doctors and nurses don't tower over the, over the patient and intimidate them. We designed the back of a house so that people overlap and they interact because it turns out better communication. We can't prescribe, but we can enable. And when they actually run into each other, they remember to ask each other about the things that they need to know about the patients they're caring about. That model's been uh, incredibly uh, successful, uh, not just from an outcome standpoint, but our net promoter scores sit in the low 80s. I think uh, Netflix or Costco is barely in the 60s, so I, we're doing pretty well. Um, I would say mostly we're doing that well because the bar is really low in healthcare. Um, we uh, are working on a, a model um, that we call integrated hyperlocal care. So um, uh, we believe that if you take uh, if you integrate uh, medical, dental, mental, and social service provisions uh, in a hyper-local model that actually goes through the front door as opposed to just up to the front door or requires someone else to come to your door, that you might actually have a bigger effect on the care um, of those with chronic disease. So the original public housing project in the U.S. is actually located in Austin. Um, when the New Deal established public housing authorities, Austin was the first to apply. Um, this is uh, one of uh, the first one in Austin. It's called Chalmers Courts. It's, uh, it's exactly what you would expect um, uh, a government would build uh, for public housing in the 40s. It's basically a miniature version of like uh, 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 suburban housing from the 40s with a stoop and a backyard and all that. Well, it's getting torn down and getting rebuilt because it's decrepit, uh, and, and we're building higher density housing. Um, but in the midst of that, we're building a 5,000 square foot uh, um, clinic that includes mental, dental, medical, and social service provision, including through the door services, because we think we can actually make a bigger difference if we lower the hurdles to that care. 
Um, we're working on social medical integration. Uh, we believe that actually centering uh, community around uh, the places they already go and destigmatizing the medical care that comes along with that um, can produce better disease care. Uh, in a little town just north of Austin, um, we're taking an 80-year-old school building and combining Meals on Wheels and a Head Start program for kids with medical interventions that everyone in that neighborhood takes advantage of. Um, we believe that social interventions, interventions can actually have positive health outcomes. There's a, in, uh, in another um, uh, locale on the east side of Austin, um, uh, they built uh, 300 units of public housing affordable public housing, we are funded to actually develop uh, just social interventions and measure the health outcomes that those change. Um, we believe that uh, mental health um, shouldn't be separate from physical health. Uh, we are working on uh, the Austin State Hospital redesign. Uh, we believe that it's less costly when patients are in crisis, which is pretty much the only way people interact with the public mental health system. Uh, the Austin State Hospital is a single asylum, it was built as that, uh, which services uh, up to 75 counties uh, uh, across Texas, from the Rio Grande all the way to the eastern border. That's something like a fifth or a sixth of the Texas population. Um, the problem is the traditional mental health system usually works this way. You show up and you, um, uh, in the public mental health system in two ways. Uh, up on the right upper corner you, um, is, is a map of, a, a depiction of the traditional uh, public mental health system. You show up either at an ER, hoping that there's somebody there who recognizes what a mental health crisis looks like, different than a physical health crisis, or more likely, you end up in the back of a cop car because you committed some crime from a mental health breakdown. That's really expensive to put someone inpatient and try to uh, solve for that. It's really expensive from a cost standpoint. It's also really expensive from a human toll standpoint. And so what we've reimagined and wrote a 178-page uh, suggestion to the legislature was that we begin to think about what an outpatient mental health system actually looks like, what it means to destigmatize or recognize when people are ill at home, at work, at play, at school, and to start to equip the system to actually keep people out of that crisis loop. You'll still need it, but actually it's much cheaper, both from a human toll and from a financial standpoint, to keep them out of that crisis loop. Um, we just got funded um, a few months ago to the tune of $168 million to actually begin that work. So, um, we are not alone. That sounds like the beginning of a horror movie or a sci-fi movie. <laughs> um, we are not alone. Um, there are other locales globally, and I've, um, I've pursued a little bit of a scorched earth policy trying to find these other places that have unique circumstances or courage to actually make change in substantial ways. And I'll share with you a few of those. Um, Singapore is undergoing pretty major healthcare reform. They've revised their healthcare system. And they can do things that we can't actually do in Austin. Uh, because they own 80% of housing. 80% of housing in Singapore is actually public, and so the government builds what it believes it needs and then, um, and then tells people to live in them. Can't do that in Austin. Um, but what they can do then is to, build, to create inbuilt in-home monitoring to manage and monitor seniors who have chronic disease, to actually move the venue of care out of a traditional clinic and only actually, and actually to do surveillance and intervene when they need help. Um, uh, we've been discussing how we collaborate on that. They are also looking at this notion of senior caregivers. Uh, they're required to retire at a certain age. Most individuals, when they retire, are still of sound mind and body. Um, what if their role is actually to care for the generation that's 10 years older, so that then there's a renewable uh, resource of informal care caregivers that gives back to society and takes advantage of the people who are still well and capable of caring? Um, in uh, uh, in Canada, we're uh, chatting with uh, Alberta uh, Health System um, because they have a unique, the only single-payer uh, provider system province in Canada. They have control over the acute care system, but they still suffer under a fee-for-service payment model for primary care, working with them to figure out what a public-private coordination would look like. In Brazil, we're having conversations about what it means to build on the community health agents. If you know anything about the community health worker um, program in Brazil, uh, widely published, um, really remarkable success. Uh, they are undergoing fiscal and, and other challenges that demand a different response in the health system. What does it mean to build on that capability? In Manchester, in England, um, what does it mean to locally integrate health and social care? They just went under, underwent devolution. Uh, the NHS gave Manchester all the money it would have spent on Manchester and said, you run your own model, locally uh, uh, produced, because we don't, we're not sure that a generic model for the entire kingdom actually makes any sense. 
So my point sharing all of this is that um, each of these problems um, are reflected in every other locale I've ever seen globally. Our problems are actually the same. And um, as, as purveyors of scientific breakthroughs and technology, I would say, you know, don't just ask what it is that you build, because we've talked a lot and heard a lot about what, but ask where. Where would I try first to see if that would have impact? Where can you enable real change at a systemic level with courageous partners and unique circumstances? And what can you learn about from those experiments that actually are applicable universally and actually solve for the problems that I see are consistent amongst every society and every government and every uh, healthcare system that's trying to do the right thing? In the end, we are not so different. Really, we aren't. And I think uh, we have an opportunity to make real change together. Thank you very much. Okay. So as Rebecca and Rocco said, it's important the questions that we ask. Yeah. All right. So in the decision making and the discussions, who's not there that needs to be? Oh, wow. <clears throat> I'll tell you who's most obviously missing. Um, Patients, of course, often right. the, 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 the human, real heroes, the, the human real, individuals we yeah. call patients. The but experts even, in the condition. But even more so than that, in medical anthropology, we have this term it's called household production of health. Right? Health, health is actually produced a household at a time, and there's actually one individual in that household who usually holds the key to that production of health. And that's usually the adult daughter, the mom, yes. right? The person who's caring for the kids usually kicking their spouse to the doctor for his annual visit and actually usually caring for both sets of aging parents. You know, I hear in healthcare systems all the time people saying, oh, we don't have enough resources to, and you've got a free resource that's willing to work for free, is hugely motivated to produce house in that, health in, that, in the household and we never leverage them. So hashtag educate the eldest female child in every household, right? Amen. And the most important question, when you're in Austin, best place to get breakfast tacos. <laughs> I'm gonna get a lot of trouble. Me torchies! <laughs> no, torchies!